Hi, folks. Welcome to another edition of Government Matters. My name is Mike Dobbs. I'm the executive editor at Reminder Publishing. And today we've got someone whose work you can see throughout the city of Springfield, but you may have never even heard of his position. And that is the city forester. And his name is Alex Sherman. And Alex, thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. I'm more than happy to be here. Now, it just so happens that uh, my boss, Steve Carey, suggested you. And then we find out you're an award winner. Um, and so Alex has recently received the 21st annual Seth H. Swift Tree Warden of the Year Award. Um, and this recognizes a tree warden who exhi exhibits leadership, dedication, and a commitment to the profession. And I think that a lot of people don't really understand what you do in the city and for the city. So let's just start off there. What's the type of responsibilities that a tree warden and a city forester has in Springfield? Sure. So in Springfield, we have a what's called a city forester. That's my position. And basically, uh, my pos my job is to manage all the public trees within the city. Um, mostly what we do is street tree maintenance. So the trees out on the tree belt between the curb and the sidewalk, um, that's, um, you know, most of, of our activity is based on those trees just because we have so much of, of work to do on those trees all the time. But we also manage all of our parklands, all the trees on our parklands, um, as well as all of our public buildings and schools. So uh, we have a, a big job um, and, you know, we, we come in every day and we, we try to maintain a healthy, productive and safe urban forest for the residents of Springfield. Now, considering that it's, it's just not trees on the tree belt and on public property. You're talking about the parkland, and we have a lot of parkland in Springfield. We're very fortunate to have a lot of parkland in Springfield. So um, how, how big is your crew that you're able to manage all this stuff and be aware if a tree needs to be uh, pruned in some way or if a tree needs to, become, to come down or if you need to plant a new tree? Uh, how many people have you got that helps you with this job? So currently the forestry division um, is comprised of nine full-time employees. Um, there's myself, an assistant forester, we have a forestry foreman, and then we have six working arborists who are out on the street every day doing the trimming and, and hazard tree removals and, and the real tree maintenance. Um, we also have two grant funded positions currently. Um, so total right now funded are, are 11 positions. So. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of work and, you know, we come in every day. I always say I have some of the hardest working uh, people, you know, in the city because we just have so much work to do um, and they come in every day and they do a great job for the residents of Springfield. As a reporter, I get to ask really ignorant questions. Um, as I tell my staff, this is one of the few jobs that you can have where you can admit your ignorance and move forward. Okay. So in, in terms of numbers, do we have an idea in terms of inventory, just how many trees are in the city of Springfield that the city has to be the steward of? So we do, we do have a very good idea. Um, we actually have a 100% digital inventory of our street tree population. Um, so we have about 32,000 street trees that we manage um, along the streets. Um, we have a partial park inventory um, and those that consists of mainly manicured areas. Um, and our kind of our criteria to collect a park tree is if you mow around it, we will collect it and keep it in our inventory. Um, that inventory process is ongoing. Um, we kind of go out and inventory new parks as we have um, the staffing available to do that. Um, but then we have a large, um, uh, a lar lot of acres of wooded um, property too. And th those trees really aren't accounted for on a stem by stem basis, but um, we do a lot of work on the trails in Forest Park um, Blunt Park, Van Horn, any any of these larger forested parcels, we do often respond to emergencies, clearing trails and things um, of that nature. But on the street, we you know it's really it, our inventory is um, an invaluable tool for us. We use it on a daily basis. So anytime we inspect a tree, we trim a tree, we remove a tree, we plant a tree, all of that information is cataloged and recorded in, in our inventory system. And each tree on the street has a GPS um, point location. So we know exactly where that tree is and we can look at its complete life history. You know, one of the most traumatic things that's happened uh, in the last few years was, of course, the tornado in 2011. 
as a homeowner with a bunch of, uh, my house was built in 1864 and I had a lot of old growth trees, all of which are now gone. Um, how, how much and how deeply did the tornado affect the city's tree inventory? So we lost about 10,000 street trees um, in the in, so that's during about the a third tornado day. event. Yes, um, so it was a it was a major event um, for our street tree population. Um, we estimate um, probably overall, if you include all of the wooded areas, public and private parcels that were impacted in the entire um, swath of the tornado, we estimate somewhere around 100,000 trees were 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 um, either destroyed or damaged during that event. Um, so it was a significant event. I mean, if uh, I'm sure most people um, are are um, familiar with the path that the tornado cut right through, you know, essentially the center of the city. Um, and so those neighborhoods were impacted um, pretty heavily. Fortunately, the nature of a tornado is just outside of that zone. Um, we saw very little impact, um, but we've we've had a put a strong effort in in the years following the tornado, and we continue to uh, try to replant um, and and regrow a, a more resilient. Um, better urban forest. So there is a silver lining there. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that while that event was extremely destructive, um, we are, I think, better off for it as a community, especially in those neighborhoods. If you drive them now, you'll see a lot of the replanting that we've done, you know, 10 years ago now is really, those trees are really starting to get established and really putting on um, good canopies and, and starting to pro provide all those economic and environmental benefits that we count on trees to do every day. So you said something that was very interesting. Basically, you've replaced the trees that were damaged with, with trees that were more resilient. So are there particular kinds of trees that someone in your position likes to, likes to plant in the city or likes to see in the city in terms of understanding that a tree in the city is probably different than a tree in the country or a tree in a forest. Sure. So when you're talking about a resilient urban forest, you're really looking at the big picture. So um, and, and that means the key word in a resilient forest is diversity. So we want to diversify our species composition across the urban forest so that we have a number of different species so that if we have a particular pest or disease that will come in and affect a particular tree, um, species or genus that we're not overly stocked in those trees. So that impact of that one pest or disease is mitigated because we have a lot of other diverse species um, available. Um, so really the a, a, a tree that I like is a, is just a diverse tree. Any, you know, mixing up different varieties of trees. There are certainly certain species that do better in urban conditions. Um, and so what we try to do is um, we follow the right tree, right place um, uh, mantra, which is we, we pick a tree for the location that we're planting it. We're not trying to just say, let's plant X number of a certain type of tree. We actually inspect a location, look at the above ground growing space, the below ground growing space, um, all of the other pieces of infrastructure, um, underground utilities, overhead utilities, and we pick a species of tree that is going to be um, is going to thrive there um, and, and be able to grow and mature and all at the same time um, require less maintenance over its lifetime. Okay, so it's not a one size fits all. You're looking at an individual place where you're going to plant a tree and what tree would be best for that location. Uh, absolutely, yep. Um, one of my reporters did a story um, in the Hilltowns talking about an effort to try to bring back uh, Dutch elm trees because they were very prevalent in the United States, especially in cities like Springfield. And of course, there was a blight that wiped them all out. Now they're trying to bring them back. So clearly what you're saying is we shouldn't have all one tree in case something happens to that, to that tree. Right, exactly. And American elm trees are very hardy, hardy urban trees, and there's a reason that they're planted widely um, in many cities and towns across the U.S. Um, they do very well in urban conditions. Um, but like you said, they were, they, the Dutch elm disease came in and they were susceptible to that, that fungal disease. And um, you know, a lot of communities lost you know, the majority of their tree canopy in, in one disease event. So we're trying to avoid that now by planting a diversity um, we on the good the good news of the um, American Elm story is 
There's been a lot of good research um, that has gone into um, developing resistant varieties and finding um, naturally resistant varieties of American elms. Uh, and so today, we, we actually plant American elm trees. Um, it's one of our um, species of choice. So if we have the location and the space for it, um, there's several varieties of, of American elm that have proven to be resistant to the Dutch elm disease, and we are currently using those. That's very interesting because uh, the piece that the reporter did talked about some of this local research that's being done. Like, It was one of the hill towns above Westfield, and they were looking at trying how to bring something back. I'm sure a lot of people call your office with comments or questions about trees in general. Do you, do you field a lot of those kinds of calls? Absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're a city department, you know, we're here for the public. Um, so, you know, if people call about what they have questions and it's something that I can, I can answer, um, I will certainly try to help them. If not, you know, I, I try to guide them to find a professional who can look at trees on their property. You know, we're responsible for the public trees. So if it's an issue with the city tree, we'll come out and inspect it and determine uh, you know, what the appropriate action to take for that tree. If it's a private tree, if I can help them over the phone, I'll, I'll try to steer them in the right direction or advise them to, um, you know, hire a private arborist to come out and, and inspect their trees. And I, I always recommend people, um, you know, do that. It's part of your home maintenance. You know, people get their uh, boilers uh, and furnaces serviced every year. Um, I recommend that you have your trees looked at. Um, you, maybe not every year, but every three to five years, have an arborist come in, inspect your trees for health and safety, um, and then, you know, that's a great way to avoid um, a lot of the annoyance of small branches coming down, or even the catastrophic event in a, a high wind event um, of a, a whole tree or partial tree failure. If you have a professional looking at it, they can look for those defects that may be. Um, unseen to the untrained eye and, and, and give you guidance on how to manage those trees. I think that's very interesting because um, naturally a lot of us after the tornado were looking to somehow replace some of our trees. Um, and I, I replaced two completely unscientifically, I, I must say. I, <laughs> I simply went and bought a couple trees. One's a maple that has just shot up incredibly. Uh, and one's a, a flowering tree that has done well, but the, the maple just has grown like, uh, it, obviously there are certain trees that are much better in, re, in getting that shade that you're, you're looking for yep. from them. And um, uh, this maple has worked out fine for me. Um, but at the same time, I mean, are there things that people living in a city that want to have a tree in the backyard and they may have a, a quarter acre lot or they may have a half acre lot is there what kind of considerations should they go into in selecting the right tree for for their property sure so a as a forester you know i've been trained i'm always thinking 50 100 years in, into the future um and and that's just the nature of, of forestry where you know trees grow on a long time frame so you're you know you're very used to thinking in these longer time frames so when anyone any anytime anyone's planting a tree I advise them, don't think about the tree that you're purchasing at the garden center um, because that's, they're all about the same size at the, at the nursery garden center. Um, look at the tag of the tree and look at the mature dimensions of that tree. Is it a 50 foot tall tree? Is it an 80 foot tall tree? Is it a 20 foot tall tree? How wide does the crowd spread, um, crown spread? Um, is it a 30 foot wide crown or is it a more narrow um, crown? And then you can use those dimensions to decide what type of space you have and what you're willing to commit to for the tree to occupy. Um, you know, if you plant a tree, a maple tree that has a 50 foot crown spread at maturity, 10 feet off the corner of your house, you're most certainly going to be trimming that tree um, and probably within, within not too long if, if, it, if it takes off. So um, I always um, encourage people to Plant, think of the tree at its, at its full size maturity and that's the type of spacing and area that you want to have um, um, to provide that tree so that there's, first it can thrive and, and, and um, occupy the space and provide the most benefits. But secondly, it's gonna, there'll be less maintenance associated with that tree because you're not gonna be constantly trying to trim it away from the house, trim it away from the driveway, trim it away from you know, whatever um, you know, other, uh, other obstructions might be in your yard. 
That's very interesting that you say this. And of course, I completely screwed up. I didn't consider anything other than, is this going to grow fast? Because I need shade again in my backyard. Sure. But uh, look, I think I have lucked out. I think I planted it further away from the house. So I'm not going to be too worried. Yep. Of course, I'll be dead soon as well. So that's the other consideration. Someone else is going to have to have a problem with it. Sometimes people view the tree in front of their house to be a nuisance because we got to rake up the, the leaves. We're concerned in a storm if the branches are going to fall on a power line. I, the way I look at it is that it's, it's a means of providing shade, which is all important and also all important, converting CO2 to oxygen. Do you think that people sometimes just take the trees in a, in a city for granted and they don't really consider about their part in maintaining an ecosystem that that we need to have maintained so yeah that's that's part of my job as well um, I, I see as as public outreach and education and that's one of the reasons I'm here today speaking with you um, to try to get people to understand the value of trees and and why we have them in Springfield and in our urban communities across the United States um, trees do require maintenance. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, it's a good idea to have them inspected um, on regular intervals um, and have them pruned and maintained over their lifetime. Um, a well-maintained tree is a much safer and healthier tree over its lifetime. So if you plant a tree and don't do anything with it for 50 years, um, as that tree develops, it may develop defects over its life that could have been corrected by a professional arborist early in its life um, and now that it's a mature tree, it's much more difficult to correct those um, or treat them. Um, so the benefits of trees, you know, are one of the things that we really try to promote, you know, as a forestry division because, um, you know, they, that, that is what gives the value back to the community. Um, they clean the air, they provide um, they reduce your energy bill through shading your home. So in the summertime, you're running your air conditioning less. Um, um, they slow uh, heavy storm uh, events, um, you know, preventing um, preventing uh, overflow events into the Connecticut River. Um, they just they do a lot for us every single day that we're not necessarily thinking mm -hmm. about. Um, and let's face it, we live in New England. I thought I think we were all used to raking leaves every fall and it can be a fun activity uh, Absolutely. if you look at it that way. Absolutely. So. I think that we've really, from a completely ignorant layman, I think that we've progressed a bit about, about trying to repair trees. There's been more than one time that I've encountered a, an older tree that someone has decided to put a lump of concrete into like a space that they thought was weak. Uh, I could never figure out why anyone would do that mm -hmm. but it seems to have been at one point a fairly prevalent cure for something that they thought was wrong with the tree do you still encounter stuff like that no that that is was a common practice at one time um the field and study of arboriculture has really progressed um quite a bit um over the last 150 years or so just to put in perspective Springfield forestry was founded in 1898 so wow Springfield's been professionally caring for their trees um, since since then and we've had a professional forester um, caring for our urban trees since then um, but over that time um, there's been a lot of new scientific research and particularly in from about the 1980s forward there's been a real um, focus on the science end of it and some really good high quality research that has gone into arbor culture um, and how trees grow, how they respond um, to in, in wind events and, and, all, and all sorts of things. And so over the years, we've gained more and more knowledge and that type of practice of putting the concrete into a tree at one point um, was acceptable. We no longer do that. We, no, we now have um, a better understanding um, of wood and, and biomechanics associated with that and, and what to look for and what is a hazardous tree and um, what, what is of concern but, but not necessarily a, um, high risk. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of things. They used to paint each, every pruning wound with a, with a tar type substance. We mm -hmm. don't do that anymore. Um, they discovered through research that when you do that, you close off the wound it actually harbors moisture in there, which promotes fungal activity. Um, 
So trees have been shedding branches for millions of years. They've actually developed very effective ways of closing themselves off to, off to inf infection. So when we make cuts, we make sure that they're at the proper location and angle, um, and we just leave them open to the air. Let's, uh, I gotta ask about your education. Uh, where did you go to school, and, and how did you decide that you wanted to do this? So my interest in forestry um, started a, as a senior in high school. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island, and my senior year of high school, we were um, asked to do an internship um, our senior year for six or eight weeks. Every Monday, instead of coming to school, we would go um, to an internship of our, of our choice. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't think I wanted to have an office, regular office job, nine to five. I liked being outside. I loved the outdoors. Um, so I got connected with a state lands forester um, and worked with him and just kind of fell in love with forestry, with trees, everything about it. Um, so from there, I went to the University of New Hampshire, um, got a bachelor's in forestry there, um, and then went out into the industry and held various jobs um, from working for forestry contractors and loggers in Colorado um, to private tree care companies in Vermont to municipal um, tree care um, uh, divisions. I'm also in, in Colorado as well. Um, and um, I was a tree climber um, for, for about four years um, and then decided I wanted to take the next step in my education and I went back to UMass Amherst in, in, in 2013, um, received a master's in science um, in urban forestry from there. Okay, and you came to Springfield, what, in 2018, In right? 2011, I came to Springfield. Oh, okay. So I um, had finished up my coursework at UMass um, and then uh, came, started working here, and it took me a couple of years to finish my master's thesis uh, while working full time, but I was able to get it done, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to that institution because they continue to be a partner um, with us in Springfield Forestry now. There's, um, we're always working with um, professors at UMass looking for different research opportunities um, here in Springfield. So we're trying to promote Springfield as um, a living lab um, and, and to promote the, the industry and the, and the knowledge and um, promote urban forestry. So even though you, you're up in tall trees in Colorado, this still offers some interesting challenges for you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So when I first started off, I was, con I was convinced I was going to be a traditional forester out in the woods and never see another person for the rest of my life. Um, that quickly changed, um, and then as soon as I got introduced to urban forestry and arboriculture, I realized how interesting it, it really is because the trees for the most part stay the same. The interesting thing about urban forestry is that it's the people. So, you know, I'm working in a community. I'm not just out in the woods with trees and other trees and more trees. Um, each tree that I'm working on, someone has a personal connection to that. That's right in front of their house. It's something that they interact with every day. Um, and so to me, um, that's one of the more interesting and can be challenging parts of my job um, is to, you know, uh, um, interact with the public and try to explain why we do what we're doing and, and how we go about it. And um, so that keeps the job very interesting. Um, and that's what I love about urban forestry. Is there a, a prevailing question that you get asked? Is there a prevailing fact about trees that people may not know about, about the tree that's in front of their house and they may not thoroughly understand what its role is? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's one one prevailing question. I think just, you know, what I find my, you know, self doing a, a lot of times is just explaining why we have trees, you know, why we have trees and why, like we talked about earlier, um, you know, why we accept these kind of nuisance things where, you know, we have to rake the leaves every year or their acorns might be dropping out of a tree. Um, and, you know, I've had overwhelmingly positive um, experiences just trying to, you know, educate people and, and, just, and just tell them the reasoning for what we're doing. And, you know, I found by far the majority of people um, come to an understanding of, of why trees are important. And um, just because it's maybe a slight nuisance to you, the tree is really there for the community. Um, and so we're all, we're all responsible for our urban forest and we all reap the benefit of that urban forest. So if none of us had trees on our properties or in front of our homes on the tree belt, then no one would have trees. So 
we need to all kind of accept, um, you know, the responsibility of, of maintaining a, a, a healthy urban tree canopy. Excellent. Alex, thank you for so much for coming in and explaining this to us because I really do think that people take trees in a community like Springfield sort of for granted. I think they sort of assume the trees have always been there, they're always going to be there. And in fact, it's not exactly that case at all. Uh, trees are a living organism and they have a, life stand, have a lifespan and, and folks like you understand that and understand how to not only maintain their life but also to replace them when necessary. Correct. So folks, if you have a tree issue, a tree belt issue, this is the guy. And you ought to be thankful that the city of Springfield does have this kind of service because it does add to our quality of life here. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Government Matters, and we'll be back soon with another.